Today I'm going to talk about the natural history of disease. Yes, we use that term when we talk about the progression of a disease from its inception to termination. In fact, there's a nice figure here. So I'm going to go in and out of this, these notes, although you have access to these notes. From susceptibility to the pre-symptomatic stage to the clinical stage and to the termination point, which is recovery, disability, or death. So let's go through these and we'll, we'll use an example, I'm trying to use a non-traditional example, obviously with, with COVID-19, that would be the ideal example, and I'll bring that up, of course, but let's use something that's non-traditional, non something like nicotine dependence. Now, with any kind of smoking, whether it's cigarette smoking, hookah, or vaping, there are risks associated with it. Most of those risks don't show up for a long period of time. For instance, if one gets lung cancer, lung cancer may take 30 years to develop. So if we wait for the pro progression to occur, we will miss our opportunity to treat individuals. So when we have these diseases that require a great deal of time to manifest, a better way to look at it is to look at a subsystem of a sub subsystem of that disease, like say, in this case, nicotine dependence. So nicotine dependence itself is a disease. So we're going to focus on that here. So what are the most, so let's talk about what are the most common nicotine delivery systems? These are questions for you, but I can answer them as well, of course. I would think like hookah or vaping is very common now. In fact, although combustible cigarette smoking, where you burn a cigarette, used to be the most prominent form or most prevalent form of nicotine delivery or system of nicotine delivery. Now it's probably, it's declining Yet, when taken together with all the different forms available, nicotine use is higher now than it's ever been. What are the portals of entry into the body? Well, it depends. You can, there's, a, there's chewing certain kinds of um, uh, substances that can provide, stimulate your nicotine receptor, nicotinic acetylcholine receptors. There's, of course, cigarette smoking. There is vaping, so those are all different delivery systems. There's even patches for people who are trying to quit. So there's a variety of portals of entry. So it could be your nose, your mouth, your skin. So there's, of course, if you're chewing tobacco, it's definitely the mucous membranes in your, in your mouth. But whenever we try to understand a disease, it's critical for us to get a, an accurate definition of the disease. Failing to have an accurate definition makes it differ, difficult for us to diagnose, and it also makes us different, diff, makes it difficult for us to calculate prevalence and incidence of the disease. And you see that with, with COVID-19, it's really hard to sometimes distinguish COVID-19 from the common cold or from the flu. So you need those, those characteristics. Like with COVID-19, probably the best characteristic for discriminating COVID-19 from other related diseases is loss of taste and smell. With nicotine dependence, well, how do we define it? There are many different definitions. In fact, most definitions are related, are, are similar for all substances, and that's a problem because every substance is different. A colleague of mine, Joseph DeFranza, published the, this his own definition, and I actually had a paper with him and a few other colleagues where we looked at what's the best way to define nicotine dependence, and his definition I think is better because it accounts for young people who are nicotine dependent. Actually, the most important characteristic of nicotine dependence is smoking within the first 30 minutes of waking up. That's problematic though for teens because teens are generally at home and it's really hard for them to smoke within the first 30 minutes if their parents are awake. So that became a, a useless definition when it came to teens. So a more general definition was created, or he created a more general definition. Three phases of nicotine dependence include wanting nicotine, craving nicotine, and needing nicotine in that order. So wanting like, hey, I, you know, I, I want a cigarette. That's different than craving one, and then different from needing one. So even if one smokes only once a week and just wants a cigarette once a week, which is more common for teens, because again, for a variety of reasons, including not being able to buy cigarettes, they can be considered nicotine dependent. So I think that's what's good about this definition. So I kind of hinted at these already, these in this nice little figure here to show the, the four stages of the natural history of disease. Let's look at each stage, susceptibility, 
during this stage, primary prevention strategies are optimal. Primary prevention means preventing the disease from manifesting in the first place. What factors increase susceptibility to nicotine dependence in teens? Well, interestingly, um, some of you may have figured it out already. People will say peer pressure. It's not really peer pressure and that people are like, hey, you better smoke or else, or you're a loser if you don't smoke. Sometimes it's just seeing other people smoke around your environment and that actually increases your belief that smoking is more prevalent so than it actually is. So a lot of times we ask we ask the cigarette smokers about the prevalence of smoking and they always inflated it, thinking it's much more prevalent than it is. So having people around you kind of increases the likelihood one will, will use. So I'd say having friends who smoke. What are some primary prevention strategies to prevent initiation of tobacco use? Education is always good, right? educating people about the risk factors and then honestly not engaging with individuals who you smoke if you can like being involved in athletics being involved in sports teams sports teams generally require individuals to not smoke because of the performance detriment detrimental impact of cigarettes and nicotine on performance so being around other people who don't smoke reduces the likelihood so i'd say engaging in sport or exercise and that's something i've done a lot of research on so i'm not just not just making it up Pre-symptomatic stage depends on what we're talking about. For an infectious disease like COVID-19, this is the incubation stage, so it means you've already been infected, right? For a chronic condition, like say something like cancer, that is not necessarily infectious, although there can be, right? We know that certain viruses of like HPV that can actually cause cancer, but in general, when we're dealing with chronic diseases, we talk about it as the latency period. So here's the disease is doing its work internally, but you're, it's not manifesting symptoms yet. During this stage, secondary prevention is of the utmost importance. So secondary prevention is when we identify whether or not one is infected or, or already, whether or not one is already in the early stages of the disease process. So we use screening in this case later in the semester, we're actually going to calculate how to do screening, right? So people who had stats with me, we already did this, right? We did PPV and uh, sensitivity and specificity. So we screen for a lot for colon cancer, breast cancer. So what barriers are there to screening for disease? Well, think about both of these. They're uncomfortable, breast cancer and the mammograms and for for, uh, for colon cancer, people generally use colonoscopies, although there are different tools. I, I use uh, Cologuard myself. Cologuard, you may have seen the commercial, the little box. By the way, it's funny, my, my sister's dog goes nuts whenever it sees a commercial for Cologuard. It thinks that box is real and it starts barking at it. So, but Cologuard itself is a newer version, a, a newer type of screening. Screening is uncomfortable. Even something like colon, uh, colonoscopy, you have to basically give up a whole day of work. You're not allowed to eat. Or I think you have to eliminate everything. So you're gonna have to you know, sit on the toilet for a while to make sure you're empty. You have to drink something to pr promote elimination, right? So it's, it's not a comfortable experience. You're sedated, so you can't drive. I mean, it's just a long, it's very uncomfortable. So that's a, a barrier. Something like Cologuard that has high sensitivity and specificity for people who are not at risk already, at serious risk for colon cancer is actually good. How do, what's a good way to screen for nicotine dependence? It's tough, especially for individuals who are not smoking a lot, right? Or not, not utilizing nicotine to a great deal. So surveys are probably the best way, asking the right kind of question. Does screening work? That's a good question. So this is important. I, I need you to know the difference between efficacy and effectiveness. Okay, this is really important. Like I put it in an exam, I trick you that way. So efficacy means that something works. It actually prevents the disease. This is a measure of validity, how valid is something, right? Effectiveness, whether or not it's efficacious, if people are not interested in it, then it's not effective. You, so you can have something that's efficacious, but not effective. Like say colonoscopy. Colonoscopy is efficacious, but its effectivity is lower because there are people who will not get it because of the, all the barriers. So you have to think of there's, there being a difference between effectiveness and efficacy. And I mentioned 
just for exams because uh, especially with with COVID-19 people talk about the effectiveness of the vaccine then when they should be talking about the efficacy because they they're mis they're confusing them and thankfully we have people who are like Fauci Dr. Fauci who actually know the difference so think about that in case it, in case it appears on an exam during the clinical stage symptoms manifest a lot of people who don't see things during the preclinical phase will see them now so that's why it's important to get screened well, screening doesn't necessarily mean that you'll live longer. So that's something that you don't deal with as much in this class you do in graduate school. You can actually talk about something called a lead time bias, where it looks like screening helps because you got detected earlier. It looks like you live longer, but actually you don't. It's just that the disease was detected earlier. Um, but in, in, during the clinical stage, people generally, when, when the symptoms get intense, they go to their healthcare provider. We can break this down into the prodromal period so this is when signs and symptoms of the disease first appear so in terms of how well a disease spreads during during this prodromal period with infectious disease disease is highly communicable as the symptoms are not yet clearly evident so you might have marring your scratchy throat dyspepsia stomach issues like i'm a zinc taker so when i when i get any kind of minor symptom i jump on the zinc right and for me i believe it works although it might be just a placebo effect, I'm not really sure yet, but for me it works. So what do you do during a prodromal period? Think about it for a second. What are the things that you actually engage in to, to try to curb the, the intensity of the disease? The fastigium is the most intense disease period, although one is very highly communicable during this period. Generally, they don't spread the disease because people are in bed or at home so they're not out interacting with people although young people sometimes are still doing that i've done it myself when i was really young i remember going out and playing sports and i was like oh, i'm sick i didn't want to let anybody down what are clinical symptoms of nicotine dependence well just go back to that measure right wanting craving and eating right? those are clinical symptoms Recovery, this is the final phase. We have, we can break this down into uh, several sub phases as well. We have defervescence, which is the period of recovery. Here, susceptibility to relapse is pretty high because your immune system is compromised. So there's these vulnerabilities. A good example was the, of this was several years ago, back when Sam Darnold, who's now with the Carolina Panthers, played for the New York Jets and he had mono. People are always saying, well, when can he return? Can he return early? And his uh, healthcare providers didn't allow him to return early because they were worried that even though he was feeling better, his spleen was still inflamed and it could rupture. So even though you feel better, doesn't mean that you should be should be going out and, and uh, performing whatever activities you do. So again, but also, another important thing is that you're still highly communicable. We actually learned this from Ebola, where people would be communicable even after the worst symptoms went off, and they could actually pass Ebola through their sperm during sexual intercourse. I think one of the problems we have, though, is that because our country pushes this strong work ethic, you have to get, even though we, we pretend to value and I, I really mean pretend to value health, we really downplay individuals who don't show up. And I saw this recently even with somebody who was coughing and driving a shuttle at a ski resort. I'm like, are you kidding me? Well, she was like, oh, you know, I felt a little sick, and but I didn't want to let the place down. So there, this work ethic thing must stop, and we're the ones who have to stop it in public health. I understand how people feel, especially with the employment shortages right now, employee shortages, but it's not good public health practice to go into work when one is not fully recovered. Convalescence is the recovery period, possibly still infectious. So you could still be communicable because you're highly social now and interacting a lot. Best thing to do then is to just be patient before one gets back into it heavy social interaction, or thankfully people are wearing masks now. I, I would suggest we should be wearing masks
for any kind of infectious disease, whether it's a common cold, flu, or COVID-19. When we're infected, we should be wearing masks. Hopefully that'll be more of a norm, more normative. Defection is when the disease is killed or brought into remission by the immune system, so you're non-contagious. Then of course, we have disability and death. One of the, it's one of the main, out, disability and death, those are two different outcomes, both of which are not good. Of course, death being worse than disability. So let's look at disability. Actually, there's a, we can talk about this later. There's a, a measure called disability adjusted life years or DALIs that are very common. We'll be calculating years of potential life loss and we can, when people die early, we can actually alter that a little bit to account for living life with disability as well. So we can break disability into impairment, activity limitation, and participation restriction. Impairment is a loss of function, for instance, like function is loss of vision, memory, or limb paralysis. Activity limitations, inability to perform basic actions like walking, typing, talking, seeing, and then Participation restrict, the restriction is an inability to participate in or, or restricted ability to participate in various life situations such as work, play, interpersonal relationships. And again, I want to go away from common examples to look at something that's a little less common. Mental health has been a focus lately. Usually it's only a focus, sadly, when, when famous people deal with it and we kind of ignore it when normal non-famous people, the, the average people, experience mental health issues. But let's look at social phobia. So this is not an, an uncommon condition. So we all have anxieties, we all have phobias, but people who have social phobia have a, a fear of people in social situations. It's not just a, a minor fear, because everybody has some fear when one goes into a new situation, but this is an intense, extreme fear of social situations situation debilitating so let's look at this in terms of impairments activity limitations and participation restrictions what time of type of impairment does one have who suffers from social phobia really the impairment here is the inability to regulate emotion so there's an inability so emotions can fluctuate in all of us yet and the, the biologic consequences of the of the emotion generally involve those that are autonomic and immediate and those that are related to the release of hormones, right? So some of those hormones, stress hormones, are long lasting and ha can have extreme debilitating effects on a person for a long period of time and make life miserable. There is this inability to self-regulate emotion and its consequences. What type of activity limitations would one experience from social phobia? Activity limitations would be speaking and eye contact. Those are two examples. If you, if you, and this is something that I think all of us need to come to terms with. Just because people don't want to talk to you or shy away from you or shy away from eye contact doesn't mean that they hate you or that they're bad people. It could be that they're struggling with these health these mental health issues or something like social phobia. I think we tend to focus only on very, very discreet and highly observable characteristics when we talk about mental illness. Yet sometimes it's these minor issues that make us feel uncomfortable when we're dealing with another individual that make us project our feeling. I studied a lot of uh, psychoanalysis, right? So make us project our feelings onto other people, right? So we have to be careful with that. So don't always assume that somebody, oh, that person doesn't like me because she or he's not making eye contact. Well, you never know. It could be cultural. In many cultures, eye contact is seen as being very negative and, and, and disrespectful, whereas it's seen as a sign of respect in this culture. And some people just maybe haven't learned the new, new norms yet. Or it could be a, a mental health issue, like social phobia. What type of participation restrictions may the individual with social phobia have? Well, they would have difficulty with interpersonal relationships, for instance. Not being able to look at somebody in the eye would be hard. Jobs. How can disability be limited for individuals with social phobia? Well, medication and therapy would, be work, would work. This is called tertiary prevention because somebody has the condition already. 
So we're using this type of prevention from to prevent the worst possible scenarios from occurring. Medications are good. There are a variety of medications that work. And therapy, ideally, would be medication and therapy. While we're on this topic, let's talk just a little bit about stress. Allostatic load is chronic stress. And this chronic stress can have tremendous impact on one's life over the long haul. If, if it's not a biologic effect, including things like ulcers or susceptibility to disease, it's certainly very uncomfortable and, and can make a person very lonely and feeling disenfranchised. So if, one, if you, for instance, are experiencing a tremendous amount of stress that doesn't seem to want to go away, this is an indication that you need some tertiary prevention. Lots of different stressors out there. One can be environmental stressors, like one na one's neighborhood, uh, one's community, for instance. I feel ex anxious every time. I, I'm a public health professional. I wear my masks when I'm in tight situations where a lot of people indoors and ventilation isn't good. Yet I go to these rooms where people, I, I will be the only person wearing a mask, even though we have a sign to say we should be wearing masks. Environmental, that's an environmental stressor, right? Or when people drive in weird ways, some people drive in cities different than they drive out in the country or something like that. In both places, it can be very bad. So that those can be stressors, not leaving to work in time, work demands, interpersonal stressors, relationship issues happen, which cause people a great deal of stress. Financial stress, high debt is, is certainly a stressor. You get like charged late fees if you pay your credit card. It's just uh, these amazing amounts of interest when you're in debt. They just keep on getting higher and higher and hurting you. So that, that certainly can be very stressful. Academic stress, I put myself there. I don't mean to be stressful, but I have to teach you stuff, especially when you do stats, people get stressed. So how can we deal with that? So I these are my my, my remedies, and I, I need you to understand them. One is planning, planning ahead. Planning your days, not just your month or your week. People have daily planners, use them. But when you use them, focus on those tasks that are most important to your overall personal goals, long-term, mid-range, and immediate, right? So when I, like for instance, doing homework, is important because not just because it's due tomorrow but because you want to be a professor or you want to be a doctor or you want to be a public health professional so you have to do your homework right so that's part of your long-term goal when i plan i also while i write down all my tasks i always focus on the ones that would cause me the most stress that's my way of dealing with tasks focus on the ones that would cause me the most stress so get rid of those first and then sometimes the other ones on the list become irrelevant so I, I no longer have to write my list of things to do. Sometimes I do because I forget stuff. And when I forget, I have to post them. Or I, I tell people actually remind me if, if something's important. And I, I, I actually tell people, you'll probably benefit from this. Hey, remind me of that because I will forget. That's the way I, I do it. But, but having a planner and learning how to use it is important. It becomes internalized after a while. That's what had happened to me. I'm going to switch, go to number three, and because I'm going to come back to number two is the last thing. Exercise is good. Exercise is a great way to reduce stress. As long as you know what you're doing, just, just don't, in the old days, people used to go running right away, and gosh, running is horrible if you're not a runner. <laughs> if you're a runner, you love it, right? It's, you get that runner's high and all, but if you're not a runner, you go out there and start running, it's going to be painful. Find an activity that's helpful, like walking. Walking is fine. Take long walks. See you don't have to necessarily walk fast. I mean, ideally we want to get some good cardiovascular fitness, but that's not necess necessary. Just go for a walk and enjoy the beauty of the environment. If you like hiking, I go hiking in mountains. It's great. Mindfulness. So this has been the greatest gift in my life. Now I, I was practicing it way before it became popular because I used to read Eastern religion and Eastern philosophy. So. I learned a lot about mindfulness. Mindfulness means being in the here and now, being present at the moment. So it's a, it's a way of focusing. Being mindless means being focused. However, it also means being accepting of your failures. So for instance, if I'm right now, I have to focus on delivering this 
presentation, I'm making this video for you, if another random thought comes in because say something is bothering me, well, what should I do? Now, some, some strategies that are used include blocking out the thought. I've, I've heard uh, people in, in certain meditations say, use words like saying shoe, shoe thought, like say shoe birdie or something like that, right? Get that thought out. Say, I don't agree with that. I like the mindfulness approach better. The mindfulness approach is accepting that you have that thought, but then letting it go. Those thoughts can be horrible. Like you can say, I hate so-and-so person. Instead of getting mad at yourself for being hateful, accept that you're a human and you have these types of thoughts. Everybody has negative thoughts. Accept them and then let them go. Now, eventually you have to work on these. So it's just being mindful isn't enough, but you do have to work on them. So one of this is where the planning comes in. Having a good plan on how to improve those areas that are causing you a bunch of stress is important. But I use mindfulness all the time. And it actually helps me because when in conjunction with my planning, I actually am able to complete a lot of tasks. I don't care how daunting they are. I'll give you an example. I have two textbooks, right? Stats and research methods. Uh, pressure was on me to write them. And sometimes I fall behind. I was able to finish them all. And those thoughts were there like, oh no, what would happen if I don't finish them? There's actually something called possible selves. There's negative and possible positive possible selves. I'm ha highly motivated by negative possible selves. Like I think if I don't do this, what'll happen? You know, they'll get mad at me or you know, I'll be homeless. The worst possible scenario and that motivates me to get things done. And I was able to get everything done. So you have to be able to follow through, but mindfulness helped. Like when I had three or four tasks there, being able to focus on the one I was doing and accept the other thoughts, like why aren't you doing this one? What if so-and-so is mad at you? letting that step aside, putting that aside while I'm doing my work allowed me to finish everything. I'll tell you one thing, one last thing, and then we're done. When you have multiple tasks, this is my, my, my secret to success. When you have multiple tasks at hand, you need to shut everybody else out. They could be yelling or texting or whatever. People are yelling where they text, right? Or emailing you. You know what? I shut everything off while I'm doing that task. I won't read my emails. I won't do anything. I won't answer anything. Just do what I'm doing. You know, I may see stuff because like the text might pop up and I look at it, but that's part of mindfulness. I accept that it's there. Let it go. Once I'm done, now I open myself up to the next thing. And that's made me very successful at, at some of the things that I do. It's the ability to put aside those non-essential tasks while I'm doing whatever I'm doing. So I'm being mindful. So you're going to get an opportunity to practice mindfulness. So I want you to do it and I want you to report on it. So I'm going to add a task for you to do related to mindfulness. Thank you very much and look forward to the next lecture.